Innovation Entrepreneur Podcast, NGL Access, on social media like that. Thank you again for taking the time to, to come on the show here in your beautiful office. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. Thank man. you. Thank you, man. All right, so let's get to it. Um, what is Journey? Um, yeah. Because yeah. I called it a social media app. Mm-hmm. Not that you got offended by it, but right. like, it's not a social media definitely, app. Definitely. Definitely. So can you get the viewers to know? What yeah. journey is and so we can get that yeah yeah so a little bit of background well first of all thank you for stopping by um definitely cool vibes at the office and i appreciate when people come through because it just adds to the ambiance so thank you and um yeah journey is uh, a pretty interesting product i'm an avid consumer and producer of content on social media and over the years i've noticed that the content on social media has become very saturated and scattered and very inauthentic Um, So when we initially started, we said, you know what, we want to go back to a tradition that's very meaningful, and that's the tradition of journaling, right? Um, If you look at the uh, historical context of journaling, there's a lot of biological um, and uh, scientific uh, effects to it, right? Physical as well, that that are positive and that are beneficial to people. And it's been a tradition people have... Um, practice for a very long time so we said you know what let's put a modern spin on it and make it something that people can access on the web Um, but we added a layer of emotions so that people can connect authentically to other people that are going through the same emotions and so on Uh, when we launched we noticed that there was very little traction and uh, progress in terms of funding so we sat down as a team and completely rethought what it means to have a technological platform in the environment nowadays and this brainstorming session was incredible because we said you know what the future of mobile the future of social media in general is um, going to be in uh, a place where people can access their their platforms very very easily and that's mobile so we're going to be shifting towards that direction we also noticed that text and photo was slowly kind of dwindling and the proof of that is the boom of uh, platforms like Snapchat. I mean just today I think Snapchat numbers came out and um, they have more active users daily than Twitter does and that shows a lot. It means that people are slowly drifting towards a place of video content, interactive content and we noticed that so we pivoted and now we're at the concept that we're at now, which is a video journaling platform, still focused on emotions, but very topical in a sense that, you know, if you're a pregnant mother going through pregnancy and you're journaling about, you know, um, a specific experience and you're surprised about it, you can connect to other mothers that are going through those similar emotions and experiences. Yeah. So very topical, very Pinterest-like, but for video. And the way we approach uh, people with Journey is, you know, it's authentic, unfiltered reality TV. We want to be able to incentivize people to post on Journey in the future. Let me ask you a question. I know I'm like flipping it, but like um, on social media, um, have you experienced direct monetization? Have you been able to monetize off of any of your content you've posted to date? Uh, Today, I wouldn't be able to. Right, right. Uh, I can say, well, this is a little cheating because I've studied Gary Vaynerchuk. Sure, sure, sure. I can say directly, no. Right. Through it, like if I post something and hey, correct. So check this out. Yes. 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 But do you know that a lot of these platforms are actually monetizing off of your content directly? Yeah. So it's it's kind of backwards, and we noticed that gap, and we said, you know what, we want to put power into the people's hands and say. You know what, if you're um, Mario and you have amazing content, right, and you're journaling about fashion and sports and, you know, family and food, and people love this content, at some point, a little bit down the road, we'll be able to have people subscribe to those those specific topics on a micro-subscription basis. So, you know, I I could pay 30 cents a month to consume all of your amazing content, and that incentivizes you, you know. Right, right. So there's a really interesting ways we're implementing monetization but it's not only for journey to continue as a profitable company but for people to be profitable brands you know we're building a uh, a portal where uh, influencers and brands can connect to each other and converse about ways to promote products because we're video only you know huge companies like nike and coke and all these people will come to our influencers on journey and say hey promote this product or service and um, we'll pay you some odd dollars and we share that mon- uh, the, the revenue. So there's this really elaborate and awesome monetization scheme that we're trying to go towards. And that's to make not only 
uh, content on social media more authentic, but to allow it to be incentivized because a lot of what we're doing on social media is just a reflection of who we want to be, not who we really are, because there's this like stigma of I got to be like Kim, I got to be like Kanye, I got to do all these things. I'm wearing a Kanye shirt <laughs> saying so, um, but that's a different subject. But point is, is, you know, we're trying to say that everyone has a unique story and it's time for those stories to be publicized. So a great example, I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but a, a great example is you know, we partnered with um, BORP, B-O-R-P, and they're a recreational disability facility in Berkeley, California. A lot of amazing individuals that have incredible stories about, you know, their disabilities and um, there's veterans that have, unfortunately, no legs and they're learning to relive their lives and participate in sports and things of that sort. So we're connecting with this audience very uh, emotionally and having their stories be told to the world so that other people that are going through the same exact things can understand and empathize and be able to be exposed to a story they haven't really been exposed to. We sent over several iPods to um, a organization called Code for Life in Afghanistan that teaches young women how to code yeah. and we want to be able to provide this technology for people so that they can also learn how to code and do these things but to have their stories be told on a platform that um, that is is meant for them. You know, it's yeah. about stories. So. That's kind of what I'm doing here with Next Generation right. Entrepreneur. Um, there's there's a bunch of other guys doing interviews. But yeah. I feel like yeah. they're interviewing the Zuckerbergs, the Big yeah. Bang, Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, a lot of times people can't relate to yeah. those people. Yeah. So having a lot of the people that I'm actually doing, they're very young and they're right. very new. Right. So I feel like people can directly correlate them. Right. So the next question I'm going to ask is, Cool, you have an app. What yeah. makes you any different than Instagram and Snapchat? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, for the other people who are trying to get into the right. social media game, right. how do they differentiate, differentiate themselves? Right. How right. Did you, what struggles did you go to by doing that? Yeah, this is a great question. So one of the things you got to really notice right off the bat is that we're a young startup. We have a cool space, but we do not have billions of dollars in the account, right? So. Going to your point about getting real stories out, grassroots stories, is very key for me because we see all of these success stories, but there are millions of apps in the app store that struggle on a daily basis. And um, to be able to give this platform for people is awesome, one. Number two, how do you differentiate yourself in a crowded environment? One thing to notice right off the bat is that it's not easy. The environment for investments, environment for social media apps and apps in general has become so saturated and scattered that you know launching a product is has become tough. Yeah. Just launching it has become tough. And then there's this whole thing about attracting users, growing that user base. And I don't know if you're familiar, but there's this marketing term um, called uh, the chasm, crossing the chasm, yeah. and essentially you know, you launch, if you're lucky to launch, which a lot of people can't do, and you get a couple hundred, a couple thousand users, and then jumping from that initial user base of pioneers to the mass market is where a majority of businesses fail because their team isn't ready, their product isn't ready, their marketing isn't in place, they just don't have the knowledge to do so. Nowadays, being successful isn't necessarily about um, coming up with the craziest idea that no one has ever seen. Granted, if you do that, you win, right? But Not necessarily, though, because you can have a great idea and not, and true. not execute. Absolutely, absolutely. But, no, I mean, I could really say an app tomorrow that looks very well and um, gives you, let's say, it's like the Yelp for uh, toilets around San Francisco. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Like, I'm in San Francisco and I need to use a restroom. I can quickly open up. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. And you can see, you know, which bathrooms are clean and so on. Please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can have it. But point is, is I mean, that's a, there's a use for it, right? Maybe it's catchy, maybe not. But uh, having an app out there and having a team behind it is one aspect. But the other is, you know, having a product that is user friendly and the experience is great. Having a product that works well with people and people love is the number one step. You cannot have a team in place and just be completely scattered with your internal processes and so on. But if the product works, you'll get the funding you need, you'll get the, you can build your team. And that's why so many people focus on just launching quickly. Mm -hmm. Biggest lesson I've learned is in a, in a very scattered environment where it's tough to differentiate, yeah. you need to launch very, very fast and be able to not be married to your ideas. Something we talked about earlier. Absolutely. 
Yeah, you can only be married to a person, honestly. <laughs> and so, and when you're launching products on the app store or you know on the web, you're when you launch your product is instantly a global product. You have no ability to filter your customer base or user base. So you have to be accepting of their feedback. You have to be open-minded. You have to be open to everything and attached to nothing. That's the mentality with, with startups and businesses in general. So to be successful, man, launch quickly. Test, test the, uh, the idea and the value prop. If you see traction, if you see people enjoying what you're doing, then you have a use case and you can leverage that, you know, the analytics that you run on the specific target um, customer and target more of those specific people and just continue to grow and, and so on. So, but it's tough. It's not guaranteed. One of the things I saw that you guys did, and yeah. that's what, so I saw, I saw Shiraz uh, tweet it and I was yeah. like, cool, cool app. Yeah. And uh, the one thing I saw in an interview, you said, the only way people can reply back in journey is to right. fail. And it that is. changed the game for me. Yeah. Because there is a lot of trolling, a lot of bullying, a That's lot a great of point. bad stuff yeah. when it comes to text. Mm -hmm. When did you make that decision to have no text yeah. allowed yeah. Uh, in journey? That's a that's a great point, and this is comes back to differentiation. You know, we saw that there is a lot of content. One of our differentiation points is having categorical content. One, yeah. right? So when I go to someone's Instagram feed or their Snapchat stories, I consume like all the bullshit nonsense that they're doing in their life and I have to tap through all of their stories or scroll past whatever it is. But on Journey, we have this concept of following topics, not people. So, you know, I come to your profile and I enjoy your food journals and I don't enjoy your family journals. I can just subscribe to the content that matters most to me, which is very focused in a sense that we're giving people the ability to consume content that they want whenever they want based on how they feel, one. Number two, is I'd say our, our money, you know, where our money's at, and that's in the video commenting threads. So we said, you know what, all these Instagram posts with hundreds of and thousands of comments um, are just trolling. You know, YouTube has this you know, bad habit of just horrible comments and bullying and so on. And I said, you know what, if you motherfuckers have something to say, get in front of the camera and say it. Like, that's how the world should be. If I'm sitting here and I disagree with something that you're saying, I should have the balls to say, Mario, I disagree. You know what I'm saying? This is real life conversation. We're, this is not scripted for the audience. Yeah. This is us just bouncing off of each other. And that's how life should be. And that's when we're most authentic. So we said, we're going to adopt that same mechanism of real life communication and do it through video comment threads. So if you feel strongly about my food journal, you can leave a comment on my food post and I can have a visual interactive discussion. The crazy thing with Snapchat is how great it is. It's, it's very one dimensional in that people are consuming stories, but they're not interacting with your stories. And there is one way interaction when you can send a text or a photo or whatever, a short video to that person. But on Journey, we have this way where you can participate in discussions of other people. You can it see is. discussion threads. You can uh, uh, begin to understand different perspectives. And that's where our differentiation point is. You can't just launch another Snapchat that looks different and hope to win. You're not going to win against the big players. They can, you know, turn over, you know, things overnight that you can't do because of your resources. So really have to drive home the differentiation. And then on top of that, make sure that you're protected. So we file patents for the video commenting threads to make sure that, you know, any players in the future that want to do similar things would have to somehow go through us. Facebook, which I'm, I texted you. Remember? Yeah, or yeah. I tweeted at you. I was yeah. Like, Yo, Facebook just did the fucking... Uh, the reactions. The reactions. Yes. Emotions. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, that caught me crazy. Right. Wow. Right. It's great for us because when we initially launched, we were very emotional like an emotional platform and that's what we were very hesitant about we said you know i don't know how people are going to interact with an emotional platform that's about emotions and topics but when facebook did the whole reactions thing where you can respond and say i feel this way and then have text associated to that i was i was happy like i woke up feeling okay well one of the biggest players in the game validated what we're doing and that means the world to journey, right? I mean, if, if emotions is where we're headed, then we're doing the right things. Another great example is um, a company called Affectiva, whose uh, co-founder is an awesome person. Her name is Rana. They just received 26 million in their Series D, and all they are are facial recognition emotions. So they take your facial gestures, 
and they convert them to emotions. And they're generating several different platforms for the specific technology, and we're uh, tentatively partnered with them, and we're working on stuff, but that's a perfect use case. Apple just acquired a company for millions. I forgot the exact number, but they do exactly what this company Affectivo does, facial gestures, emotion recognition. That's the direction we're headed. We did like, dislike, we commented, we post photos and stuff, that's done. Now it's about how do I feel what Mario's feeling? How do I feel what the audience is feeling? Eventually it could be like people are watching this and I felt happy listening to him. Absolutely, absolutely. And you begin to understand things that you've never understood, right? One of the the main use cases, I come from an interesting background. In college I studied bio-sci, neurology, physiology, and behavior alongside economics. And so the health industry is very important to me. Um, I didn't go to med school and I got my MBA, but that's my personal choice. And I've been able to still have a foot in the door with health. And one of the big applications we want to hopefully use Journey for is to be, begin understanding patients' you know, stories. You know, People that are going through cancer can use Journey to show their emotions and show their topics that they're going through. And to be able to understand the trends of emotions and associate them to experiences I mean, who knows? You might be able to find some type of cure for cancer and emotions. You never know. I mean, that's the direction that the world is headed, though, and we're kind of at the forefront. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, this this question is kind of um, it's from one of my viewers, a good buddy. Actually, uh, he was on the show. He's right. A car salesman. He's, okay. He asked me this question. How? And I'm pretty sure a lot of other guys are gonna ask this question. Yeah. Yeah. How, I have an app. I want to start an app. Mm. How do I get funding? Yeah. Uh, you recently, congratulations on Thanks. getting the big funding from the CTO, the ex-CTO of Yahoo. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. How, how did you get in contact with these people? Yeah. How does this happen? Yeah. Uh, man, as a, as a startup CEO, I think the biggest challenge is getting the money to keep pushing your business forward. You know, you can have the brightest design minds, you can have the greatest brand team, you can have a great product, but if you're not... Uh, raising the capital to do the things that you want, it's tough. But in this environment, especially now, the investment you know environment has changed, right? So 10 years ago, you can fart an idea and you'll get five yeah, million. Yeah. <laughs> so, right, but now it's changed. And I think you know there's a lot of pushback in terms of like people talking about a bubble in the Bay Area. They're talking about you know the the uh, the lack of um, investment resources and things of that sort. And I experienced that firsthand, man. I've went out, we, when we first launched, like two days into it, we had several thousand users on the platform. All great. And when you think about like pitching it to investors, you're like, they're gonna love this. Several thousand in the first two days, it's, we're gonna get cash, no problem. I go to like 10 to 15 different pitch events within two to three days. I pitch my heart out and we do extraordinarily well. We get a lot of great feedback, but it didn't result to a a cash option, right? People are going to put in the money. And it's tough. A lot of people want to see your team struggle and go through the hell of like being close to fail and then get past it and then get to mass market before they dump their money. And that's why as a young startup, the only real viable way of raising money is to go to angels and try to get money from people that you network with. Um, Biggest thing, obviously network is your net worth. Go out there, you know, meet as many people as you like. Have no shame. You got to put yourself out there. And once you meet someone that's semi-interested in what you're doing, you got to, you know, keep pushing forward. Yeah. When you're networking, yeah. um, how do you not be that spammy guy? You know, yeah. Ask yeah. everyone in the world. Funny enough, yeah. we met through uh, Twitter. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. was really funny. I tweeted out to Gary V what he thought of Right, me. right. You tweeted back at him. And right. Then, yeah. And at the time, you, it, was, it said Chief Idris Officer. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I was like, yeah. who the fuck is this? <laughs> uh, and then I'm like, oh shit, he's the CEO of Dr- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that's how our connection happened. Yeah, yeah. Should these guys be hitting them up through social media or should they you yeah. know, their doors? How do they get in contact with these VCs? Angels? Right, right. Uh, what's your... So social media has, hasn't resulted to shit for me. Period. And same with emails. Cold calls haven't resulted, resulted to anything positive. Um, these guys, these investors are very incestual. They only mess with people that they know. So a lot of these big time venture firms and um, 
institutional investors, you go to their websites, you'll see that a lot of them say, you know, only contact us if you have a reference, right? Wow. So that's the key. A lot of what you do is to not be spammy. You have to have a value prop. When I go to these meetings, my value prop is like, I'm the only fashionable, hip, cultural dude in this place. Everyone else is a nerd. Seriously, no, yeah, and yeah. that's my value prop, and that's how I stick out in a room full of 90 different tech people, you know what I'm saying? So you gotta find a way for yourself to stick out, whether it be your charisma, your, you know, what you bring to the table, whatever. I never once met an investor and said, hey, would you wanna invest in this? It's always about relationship building. You wanna allow your network to be there in the long run. It's not a transactional thing, right? So when I go to a, a pitch thing in, in Berkeley, I'll pitch the product, and. You know, I'll talk to people and I'll never ask for money up front. It's always, you know, scheduling a meeting to have another meeting until you get to the point where you're so comfortable with the person and they're so comfortable with you that they write a check. It's never the case where you're going to get a check on the first pitch. It takes months. It takes nourishing of these relationships. And that's the way it happens. You got to go out there, meet a shit ton of people, make great relationships. And sometimes, Mario, one of those guys that you meet isn't going to be the guy that writes you the check, but his best He'll friend connect yeah. will connect you. Well, it, and that's the case. Example. Yeah. The only reason I found out about Journey was right. because DJ Shabazz tweeted it. Yeah, and yeah. And that's how this whole thing started. Yeah. And, guys, this interview, I've been trying to get this guy, well, to you for <laughs> Thanks, man. Months. Yeah, it's been tough, yeah. And I know every time I'd call you and be like, you're busy. Right, like, right. Is this guy going to want to work with me? No, yeah, it's not the case. It's just it's time. time. It's yeah, it's yeah. Patience. Right, so, right. So, yeah, and this, this sorry to interject, no, but no, the, no. the ex-CTO of Yahoo that invested, that didn't happen of me just meeting the person at a meeting. I knew someone, that someone put me in front of Remy Stada, and I was able to pitch it to him. Yeah. And, you know, funny story is, is, dude, before that meeting, I had this, like, major anxiety attack. It was, like, the first time where I was like, man, we absolutely need the cash or else we're going to completely just go down the drain. Even though people love what we're doing and they think that we're, like, doing well, yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't have anything, you know, to show for. We're scraping for our cash. So I'm driving to this meeting, and I'm like, I get this anxiety attack. I pull over. I go to a gas station, and I puke. Wow. And I end up being, like, two minutes late to the meeting, and I in the car, before I went inside, I told myself, this shit is not worth it, dude. Like, being so stressed about finding cash and so on is not worth it. The way I'm going to approach these things from now on is to have a mindset where I just don't give a fuck. Like, if people fuck yeah, with me like, or my product they will i don't need to beg them and get to get on my knees and do all these things and make myself feel anxiety driven if people fuck with me they will and eventually good energy will come and things will work and that's what i did i yeah. walked in and i was i literally felt as if journey was was going to be just fine i knew exactly its worth i knew my worth and he felt that vibe and um he pulled pulled the trigger and that took a month though like we met him and then we met him again and so on and so forth so it's uh, interesting it's something yeah. that I'm working with something my yeah. buddies talk about all the time coming right. out of a place of abundance versus yeah. coming out of a place of lack right and, right um, I think when you come out of a place of abundance you kind of just stop caring absolutely um, you know I was worried absolutely like, for weeks and it's funny because I'm opening I'm being vulnerable here yeah like, absolutely he's probably not going to want to meet me like yeah. who, why does he want to even meet me and I was like you know what it's okay right it's fine if he doesn't want Right. I'll find other people to Right, right. And it just happens naturally. Yeah, yeah, it happens. So. When you and that's dude, I'm telling you, it's not a matter of me not meeting you by yeah, the way. Yeah, it's yeah. it's just so busy. And when you don't force things, you know, it's and you allow them to happen naturally, a key thing for me, the biggest lesson I've learned is to not stress about the things that I cannot control. control. And that's the hugest lesson. I mean, you have employees, you have things that are just moving and for you to be stressed about every single piece and bit of the project makes you so spread thin you know you get physically drained mentally drained so now what I do is I think about my life in states right I come to the office and I'm like all right right now I need to be motivated I need to have energy I need to accomplish these tasks and I tell myself my, my brain that I need to be happy and need to have energy emotions are states man you're not gonna always be sad. You're not gonna always be happy. You're not gonna always be angry. You gotta be able to control yourself and say, right now, I, it's okay to be angry, but I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna draw a line and move on to being happy and motivated and so on. And that's helped me a lot, man. So, what yeah. I learned was living in the present moment. Yeah. Um, a good mentor of mine, he said, 
can't live in the past because the past already happened. Yeah, and absolutely. Can't change that the future yeah. technically doesn't exist, so why worry? Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I live now. Absolutely. And I was like, once I learned that, it just freed me of all this. Right. Hey, right. Well, one thing I want to quick get into is uh, sure. your swag, dude. You're, Thanks, you're man. Completely <laughs> different from every other CEO I appreciate out that. there. Yeah. Uh, you have a big background in music. Can you right. Talk a little bit about yeah, that? yeah. Interesting enough, I um, so in my college career, I did an internship at Sean John, um, and I was interacting directly to Diddy, and it was really interesting, man. One of my first tasks at the place, and I was uh, interning for. Derek Roach, who was a Diddy stylist, and I think he still is at the, the, this time. Derek is probably one of the most incredible people, very flamboyant, very awesome, very energetic and charismatic, but knows his shit. I was able to understand a lot from that situation. I learned about work ethic, I learned about respect, I learned about punctuality, um, and I learned about swag. I was delivering, I was delivering lunch to you know the head of Barney's, and. I was being exposed to all this beautiful clothing and the way the fashion industry works and how fashion and music are just this kind of synergistic like thing, you know. And I was exposed to music, man. I was there. I, I kind of uh, messed with Danny D. Kane and um, a lot of these different artists that were under Bad Boy at the time. And Cassie just came over from Ryan Leslie's camp and. Um, I've been involved with music. I've never been musically inclined myself. I've never been talented enough to like play a guitar, but my ear for music has always been there. And um, I guess my taste has, has my taste buds for music are good, and that enabled me to get a foot in the door and just understand the business and so on. And I've leveraged that stuff to be able to manage artists myself and try to push things forward in the Bay Area, which I'm doing. But I spent some time at translation marketing and. Um, I went to BET for a few weeks and that experience was incredible at translation I was responsible for bringing McDon McDonald's in the cafe from Europe to America and I was part of that whole marketing campaign so I you know did demographic studies and we interviewed people and we created a, a, a campaign a marketing book a huge deck of like different things that we were going to do for that service and I came home, lo and behold, and some of the marketing campaigns we worked on ended up on TV, and it was just an incredible experience. I wasn't there for a long period of time, but I was there enough to understand the gist of the business and be exposed. Um, coming back to the Bay, um, I'd say a lot of my swag is definitely based off of the people that I interact with. You know, um, a lot of people I love are into the fashion industry, and. They've kind of, yeah, my cousin, yeah, Dia Shabazz has his own shop in Lane. It's called Lane SF, or Made in Lane, and he has his own label, which I've helped him uh, with the website and things yeah. of that sort. And yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. He's a good guy, and he'll, he'll definitely sit down with you. So, and, and a lot of my, my fashion inspiration comes from the likes of Pharrell and um, in the past Kanye, not recent Kanye. I mean, I feel like a lot of a lot of the the Kanye movements lately is just very pretentious, and uh, I'm not into that. I'm a, I'm about being as humble as you can possibly be, and I know that that's his brand and that's who he is. But uh, to some extent, it's I think marketing. it is marketing, it is marketing right. right? But I'm all about you know the the impact through your character. You know, I, when you leave, you you your work is definitely left. His work is definitely going to be there. But there's going to be a lot of people that have a this shaded view of him, a yeah. tainted view of him, and that's and why isn't Pharrell viewed that he'll way? You know, be, he'll yeah. never be because he has this different persona. Granted, I respect his creativity to the next level. Kanye is like thing, yeah. up here for me when it comes to like Steve Jobs and so on, but. I gotta find my own brand, and that brand is just being nice, yeah. <laughs> like hey. like everywhere you go to everyone, you know, no matter who they are. So, so. I want to talk about this. I, I sent yeah. you a text the other day, and it was about fear, because at the time I was yeah. afraid of this. I was afraid of yeah. putting myself out there. I was afraid of failing. Um, yeah. For those guys afraid to to start their next project, fear is something yeah. that really holds people back. Absolutely, man. Uh, you sent me a really long text, and I still have it. I'm yeah. Post it up eventually, but right on. Why? How does? Let me try to word this properly. Um, how, why does fear stop us, or how, why do people let fear stop mm -hmm. us, and how mm -hmm. can we overcome that fear? Yeah, yeah. Fear, fear is an interesting thing, man. I think it stems from a lot of who we are. Our natural, instinctive things are to run away from things that are potentially going to kill us or hurt us and so on. I mean, fear is in instilled into us. 
It's just a matter of us being able to manipulate it. If you don't have theory, you won't be able to be a human being. You have to have it to some extent. The key is understanding that um, you have to direct fear into things that matter and not direct it into things that don't matter. A key thing that I always tell people that ask me the same question is, take a, take a zoomed out version of Earth, get in a, in a spaceship and fly out and view Earth from a perspective that's that you've never seen before and really internalize that you're looking at this big ass blue and green planet that's very organic and natural and has one very small purpose which is probably something that we overlook and it's a big thing is just to be natural and living and so on these systems that we've created man the educational system the business sector all of these different schemes that that have been created on earth are literally created by humans literally this thing about making money and being the top person in society, having the nicest clothes and nicest cars, this is all shit that we made. And when you begin to really internalize that, you begin to lose complete respect for, for fear when it comes to things you can control. Starting a business does not have anything to do with life or death. It doesn't, and it should never affect your motivation or inspiration, right? Life is about being and living and contributing and impacting. The fear of losing money, the fear of failing, the fear of this, the fear of that, is taking everything personally. It's like saying, I matter, my ego is the biggest thing in this world that matters, therefore I will allow fear to exist because I don't want it to hurt me, I don't want it to affect me. When you begin living for others and not yourself, fear kind of just dwindles, man. I'm starting a business so that it can impact people. I'm starting fashion lines so that I can make people look good and feel good. When you begin to think that way and not like, oh, well, if I started and I fail, that's going to affect me and my you know, reputation. When you get rid of that type of thinking and you literally think about impacting the world only, you will live fearlessly, period. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's true, man. I mean, you think about like, you know, people that go out into the world and do nonprofit work and so on. They are the most fearless. Because they don't get big checks cut out. They don't get their name put up on television. But they're still taking leaps of faith to impact people. Those people are fearless. People that are scared shitless to start a business are thinking selfishly. Change that. Think about starting a business that impacts people and that does positive things. And don't think about yourself as the, the culprit, the main thing in this whole thing. And you begin to lose all that fear and all that bullshit. Think about sports and all that. It's the same concept. We we fear and and we fear things that we just simply cannot control, and it's all like egotistic. That's all, man. You just gotta get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy because I've read so many books and listened to a lot of audio books. Right. Many ones that put it in that perspective. Yeah. A lot of people say like fear is like oh it's this thing, dude. You gotta live now, and when you live now, you lose all sense of fear. But that's bullshit, dude. Fear exists. It's part of who you are. You just gotta channel it and funnel it into different things what I've yeah. seen based on successful people that I've talked to yeah fear is in them they yeah. just learn to take action regardless of absolutely bro every day I have a fear do I make this decision is it going to impact our finances is it going to impact our growth every I mean as an entrepreneur you got to have fear to some extent it's just a matter of viewing the probabilities and going with a route that is most favorable yeah. entrepreneurship isn't about jumping off a cliff dude it's about jumping off a cliff that's strategically, you know, is there going to be a pad at the bottom for me to land on? You know what I'm saying? It's about looking at your probabilities, reducing risk as much as possible. Some people think quitting your job and quitting all this bullshit and just jumping into entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship. That's false. You can be in entrepreneurship in every realm of life. You can work corporate America and still have the spirit of an entrepreneur, start new ideas and things of that sort. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about entrepreneurship, and it's my show, Next Generation, Next Generation Entrepreneur. Yeah. What is an entrepreneur to you? Yeah. Uh, so I went to Babson College, and they're ranked number one in entrepreneurship in the world. Um, and I was very lucky enough to be able to get an education from them and leverage a lot of the techniques and so on. And the main thing they teach you is that entrepreneurship is really just about, you know, a few things. It's about harnessing the spirit of creativity and innovation yeah. and implementing it through action. 
So it can mean that in, in any context, man. I could have a nine to five job and I can be an entrepreneur. Yeah. What does that mean? It means being at my job and finding ways to solve problems within my existing business, helping create new ideas within an organization. A lot of companies like Google and Apple have teams focused on just building new businesses within the corporate realm, right? So Nike um, has opened up several positions in the past several weeks of, and the positions are entrepreneurs and re residents. So these people work for Nike, but they create businesses within this umbrella and there's teams that help collaborate and do these different things. Um, you can have a small business. You can have a fashion label. You can be an entrepreneur and in, in an artist, yeah. right? A, a musician. A, I think the purest form of um, entrepreneurship is an artist, right? I mean, I think for a very long time, people that paint, people that create art, don't get paid the craziest amount, you know, but they do things that go out on a limb and they create and they impact and so on. They're innovative. That's entrepreneurship. You don't have to get paid to do things that are... Learning, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. that revolves the next thing. What is... What does success mean to you? Yeah, yeah. Success is, um, first of all, success doesn't mean anything if it's not shared, one. Yeah. Um, and to me, at least. And number two, success means uh, fulfillment. Um, there's times where you can, you know, people have won Grammys, people have won Emmys, people have won incredible awards, have made billions of dollars, but they lack something within and they've abused drugs and they've done horrible things in their lives, you know? Success is without fulfillment is, is failure and that's that's it fulfillment is making an impact on someone's life It's making a product that's worn by people that's enjoyed by people um, Apple is a great example, you know, that's Steve Jobs and what he did embody success even though it hurt him and he ended up yeah. dying um, his products and services lived on and they impacted people in a way that has completely blown things out of proportion, you know, it's changed everything it's a paradigm shift and that's success you know to be able to give people in third world countries tools to learn the same things that others in first world countries are learning that's success success is fulfillment impacting people on a uh, local uh, national global whatever it is as long as it's one person that you're impacting that's success you know i, I, I probably repeat this in every right. interview and people are going to get tired of it eventually that's okay <laughs> that's for them uh, I've learned that everyone just has a different yeah. uh, definition of success. Absolutely. And that's yeah. the beauty of it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I always try to end up with those three questions. The last one is, is there a moral or philosophy right. that you live your life by? Yeah. Um, so two. And I, I've said the one of them a lot, and that's impact, right? Um, if you're doing things in this world and they're not impacting people and they're completely selfishly driven there's really just no point of doing it at all. That's how I live my life. So whether it be um, you know, managing artists or creating different things or working with or consulting with other organizations and helping them, building journey, everything is about impact always. And that's how I stay motivated. I wake up and I'm like, how can I not make Idris happy? How, how can I not make um, Idris self-fulfilled? It's more so how can I um, how can Idris contribute to this world? You know, crazy, that's changes. When you think like that, it actually yeah. causes you to get more. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it causes you to get more good stuff. Yeah. Like I learned that. The yeah. more you give, the more you get. Absolutely, that's yeah. very very true, and that's how energy works, dude. You put in energy, and it comes back in some form. Um, the second is this phrase that I, I live by, and it's adapt or die. You know, um, whether it be in the business realm, your own personal self, whatever it is. You have to learn how to adapt, you know. This is how things have existed. This is how certain things exist today, is they've constantly adapted, you know, the natural environment they've learned and they've they've changed their form to be able to live and survive and you gotta be able to do that. In the business realm, it's understanding the business landscape, it's understanding the competition, it's understanding differentiation and constantly finding ways to stay relevant and innovate yourself. It's adapting in any scenario. You know, um, it's me being here and being myself and then going to a dinner with very sophisticated people and understanding that I need to maybe not act the same way or not use the same language. Like Adapting, you know, um, to the certain environment is key. You got to be like a chameleon. Actually, that's a you good know? thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ty Lopez said that you got to learn how to be a chameleon in life. Absolutely. And I 
messed up a lot of times in my life. A lot of people do, yeah. And, and that's, it comes back to this thing about people having this sense of complacency, you know? Like, they're so stuck on one way of living, and they're like, this is it. This is all there is. I, I tweeted yeah. it. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, I don't think I have. Shout out to my homie Trey. So Yeah. He said, bro, like, I asked him, what's one of my biggest flaws? And he said, you are so stuck on yeah. one way. He's yeah. like, there is no right or wrong in yeah, life. Yeah, absolutely. There is no right or wrong in life. No. There's just not. Yeah, if all these self-help books actually worked, everyone in the world would be happy. Yeah. Bro, there's, there's no definition of how you should live life, one. And I think the key to stay successful is, um, one, it's funny, successful, one of the big words is full, and fulfillment is, you know, there's, there's this kind of synergetic thing there. Um, but point is, is you got to be able to adapt, you know, and you got to be able to understand the environment and be open to everything and attach to nothing. Um, and live with a sense of fulfillment um, alongside all of these things and you will be successful. So, so I yeah. feel like we would honestly be cool. here all day. Yeah, I, I can go on and on, dude. We got a good uh, on a interview. Not an interview. Uh, Meetings, meeting yeah. yeah. But I, I've been doing this and they're going to catch on. I right. always give a gift to my interview. Oh, right on. So cool. Funny, you didn't have to, man. We met through, we met through this guy. It's, it's interesting how it plays along. But... Uh, <laughs> Because of this guy, so I oh right I'd on! Give you the book. Oh right on, dude. I've That's awesome. Read it and listened to it, so I feel like you're gonna. I really appreciate that, dude. Gary V is like the ultimate, the ultimate motivation and inspiration. The dude going back to adapting. The, his his he's like the definition of adapting. Yeah. All of his businesses. I mean, he is open to everything. A new business comes out, social media platform that he sees he can leverage for his business. He will go in and attack and learn. And he's just like a monster. He's hey guys, a monster. If you haven't already, I, I probably yeah. mention him all the time. Please yeah. take a look at Gary Vaynerchuk and what he has to say. Right on. Like yeah. That, so. And man, shout out to Gary V, man. If he's ever willing to sit down and talk, I'd love to pick his brain. And uh, I feel like... Um, one day, bro. Yeah, one day. Hopefully, I'll meet him and you get to meet Yeah, him. exactly. Exactly. And before we cut, man, I know my homie Danny is over there and you put me on blast for wearing a uh, Kanye shirt. So I have to come correct. Um, I respect Kanye. I love Kanye. Uh, I just his his character. That's all. I love his music. Obviously, yeah. changed a little bit. Right. Yeah, we all changed. So it's yeah, cool. yeah. Thank you again, man, for yeah. being on the show. Right on. Thanks, Mario. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, bro. All right, man. All right, bro.